Hi, good students. This episode, in this episode, uh, we are going to be looking at another set text in uh, KCSE Anthology Paper 3. Not anthology, but in Paper 3 set text. This set text will replace the blossoms of the Savannah by Henry Ole Coulet. And this one is done by Paul B. Vita. And that is Fathers of Nations. This set text will be uh, tackled and will be the, the coursework of the students of the year 2023, late, earliest 2020, no, late 2022, that is. And it will make part and parcel of the compulsory text that will be covered during that physical year. Hi, good students. You shall go straight to chapter 1. Chapter 1. Four strangers checked in at the Sea Mount Hotel in Banjul the same evening. None of them knew of the other three, or about being one of the four. By giving them rooms on different floors, in different wings, the hotel did little to change that happenstance. The first to check in was a male African, 60 years old, give or take. After setback in some kind of war, his hairline had retreated all the way to his crown. But there, but there it had held no more hair loss. He had a weird habit of smacking his lips as he talked, appearing to shape each word first and to add voice to it only after. Arrival formalities required him to complete and sign a, sign a registration card at the front desk. He signed it as Karanja Kimani, a professor in the Institute of Development Studies at Kenya's University of Nairobi. The hotel gave him a room on the fourth floor of its east wing. Next to sign in was an old African, say 70, also mayor. In moments of speech, <coughs> a mustache wreathed over his mouth furiously like a moth fighting to free its wings then fly away he signed in a comrade ngobile belusi a, Zimbab a zimbabwean citizen in the blank his registration card had for his occupation he deviantly wrote not applicable the hotel put him in a room on the fifth floor of the south wing then yet another African male, 50, perhaps younger, checked in, big and flabby. He looked like a failed summer wrestler, but this feature was not evident now. He had buried himself under acres of loose robes, topped with one. Of those cone-like cups that, by design, not flow, always flop to their left, there was something about his eyes. They narrowed into slits when he relaxed, narrowed further when he smiled, and vanished altogether when he laughed. His registration card said he was Pastor Chineke Chiamaka, a Nigerian clergyman based at the Lagos branch of the CIA Church in South Africa. He took a room on the sixth floor of the West Wing. Last to check in was an Arab African, again, 
male 40 plus years old his work just had to be an act of rebellion each step was an angry trust did he intend his motion as a gesture of protest against something few knew his left eye was artificial he checked in as an engineer Saif Tahir a Libyan formerly employed by Tripoli's Ministry of Defense. He got a room on the third floor of the North Main. Wonder after wonder welcomed the four new arrivals to the Seamount as they headed for their respective rooms. Elevators here could talk. They announced every stop that they were about to make before they made it. Floors were pneumatic. They turned walking into a cautioned adventure on sponge. Then there were the rooms. They offered incontrovertible proof of an inconceivable feat that a stable equilibrium between African and European uh, decades in achievable after all. To round things off, an exotic fragrance spiked with an insistent scent of sandalwood, twerked all rooms with a whiff of Asia. Professor Kimani had been in his room for barely an hour when the phone rang. He looked at his watch, not seven yet. He looked out at a window, pitch dark already, God Almighty. How thick and fast falls the African night. As a heavy rain of ink, he thought. He picked up the phone. Karanja Kimani? A male voice was on the line. Professor Kimani did not respond. Hey! The voice had aged itself with anger. I had you pick up. It tried again. Is that you, Professor Kimani? I have an urgent message for you from AGDA. It pronounced as Agada, like a word Agada. This time, Professor Kimani did respond. AGDA, Agency for Government for Governance and Development in Africa, had sent him here. Correct. He said, I am Kimani. Then may I welcome you to the Gambia, Professor Kimani. AGDA absolutely insists that you accept a guide, me, now, before you go pacing up and down Banjul, worrying yourself sleepless over this decision. Let me assure you, I'll do everything I can to make your mission here a success. You have my word. Nigerian accent. Professor Kimani concluded, going by the voice, tendency to inject anger into every stressed syllable educated nigerian accent he is supposed after factoring in the impeccable grammar who are you he asked later snapped the voice irritably fast i'd like to know if you have received a briefcase i left there for you
Professor Kimani looked at a briefcase his hotel had just delivered to his room. Yes, I have. I can't open it though. Did you scramble its locks perhaps? One, one, two, four. Sorry, what was that? Key for the lock. Set the lock on that and the briefcase will open. Now, before you do anything else, first make sure it contains all the items it ought to have. They are listed on a rooster. On a rooster, you will find inside. Oh, oh. Professor Kimani, yes. That was an order. The voice paused. It expected protest. When none came, it raised the ante. Obey. Professor Kimani still did not protest. Excellent. So, how much time will you need to acquaint yourself with the material in your briefcase? Do you think one hour? I'll call again. Well, until then, you are about to forget something. Me. Forget? A cocky educated Nigerian, Professor Kimani told himself. I asked who? Oh, that. Let's just say my name is Guide. I am your guide, after all, am I not? I meant your real name. What is it? Professor Kimani had the line killed suddenly at the other end. <coughs> Comrade Melusi got a similar call after Pastor Chimia Chiamaka later. Engineer Tahir last. All three said they had failed to open their briefcases. The caller gave each the key. One, one, two, four. Abiola heard something hail him. He turned to look. There she was. She wore a scarlet blouse, a black skirt, red high heels. Who was she? She dipped into his memory in search of her identity, but she came, but came a blank. She was not anyone he could remember. Perhaps she had hailed somebody else. He looked around. No one else had stopped, which made sense. She had called his name. Well, who was she? And why had she chosen him? She hailed him again. Dr. Afolabi. May I please have a word with you? Me? He brought a, play, a palm to his chest. Are you sure? You are my man? All right. She did not bat an eyelid, which means you will follow me. This way, please. She headed towards the corner, so if you will sit here, she indicated a chair by window. Two minutes is all I'll take. Well, maybe three, but five at the most. She sat down. He sat too. Two, three, five. Where is the difference? I'm Fiona. Her minutes had started ticking. Fiona Mackenzie. Let me begin by thanking you for... Uh, wait, wait. Can I tell you something else first before I continue? See, whenever I add that Mackenzie bit, people look at me. Uh, quizzically and with their eyes demand an explanation. And the explanation, Mrs. Mackenzie, is... Adapted by Ian and Elspeth Mackenzie, Scottish missionaries. They are back in Edinburgh now, but they were in Banjul then. I was less than a year old. Cute as a button and full of beans to boot, he thought. Then he spotted a flaw. Her eyes were wide and white like moons. A bad sign. They betrayed innocence while the wolves could exploit. There she was, moon-eyed like a lamp, without parents, and yet she was opening up to him. A total stranger. This wench was no good even at her own safety. She continued, My natural parents, Gambian, I will never see them, though. You know, dead. Her eyes closed in what may have been an intended moment of silence, and then opened. Oh, well, it happens. Goodness me. What am I what am I doing? Dictating my autobiography? She wriggled in her seat, apparently to change gears. Let's talk on record now. She got out of her handbag a small device. She switched it on. Mind if I start recording? Say no. No, you're a reporter. For the Gambian news, she crossed her legs. This reminded him of a hypothesis he once had a boastful skirt chaser. What a jerk. Put forth. 
that female legs only a cross, cross to suggest that they can uncross. So how can I help you, Mrs. Mackenzie? I would like to ask you a few questions, if, if I may. Let me start you off. My name is Afolabi, which you seem to know already, but call me Abi, short for Abiola. My first name now, take it from here, PhD, Political Science. John F. Kennedy, School of Government, Harvard University, currently Senior Lecturer, University of Ibadan. She smiled. I got that from the blog on your failure of state. Pleased to hear she knew about his book. He lowered his gaze to serve his fame in the correct manner, with humility that she could clearly see. This black Scottish woman, Scottish woman, surely knew her a trade, he thought. Oh, when I had you were here, she meant this sea mount hotel, I decided I had to come, so here yeah. I am. She opened her arms as if to let him in for a hug. Funny, funny. I expected to see a duo slob in rumbled clothes, you know. The archetype of you academics, the world of instead, what do I see? Cook my goose if there isn't a real person with a winsome smile at that. I mean, look at you, just look at you. You have real shoes, real air, actually, real everything. I'm sorry I've disappointed you, Mrs. Mackenzie. He was not, in fact. He had liked her random chatter with its gra uh, graduation's assessment of his smile, which he thought had won her in mere nanoseconds. Now tell me, do you always talk this freely? 40? Your age? No, 45. To my 35, fancy that. Go have your picture taken now. You won't always look this gorgeous. I'm not joking. Dr. Afolabi, go. Mrs. Mackenzie, was there anything else you wanted me to tell you? She slapped herself lightly on the cheek in mock self-punishment. I was beginning to run on there. Was that I? Please. To Toot toot. Now then, Africa's heads of state will soon begin a debate at the Pinnacle Hotel, two streets from here, which I'll be covering. I understand you are neither you are the advisor, so give me some background. What will they be deb debating? Way Omega. See, a year ago, Nobel laureates, 20 of them announced that they had discovered a way to develop Africa and published it as a book with that title. Africa's development planning ministers immediately bought copies to have a look. They liked it. 
Now Africa's heads of state are in Banjul for a summit to ratify it as their common growth strategy. That's the gist of it, Mrs. Mackenzie. Or did you want actual content? She took her head. What's your take? Don't get me started. We are talking about a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity here, Mrs. Mackenzie. First, and this is only the smallest part, way omega will turn African politics inside out. Just think. No more military coups, no more rigged elections, and, well, no more full play, period. Dr. Afolapi, the heads of state attending your summit are all certified full players. The host himself is a fuller. He rose to power through a military coup. I suspect he is no hurry to trek along any way, Omega. Then, there is the most durable fuller of them all, the president of, you know, what country I mean. He was president long before many of the others were even born. Way Omega isn't the kind of god that Dinosa will adapt either. Is it? Change is an, e an even context, Mrs. Mackenzie. From its blue corner, defenders of the status quo are already sure to About their laws if present arrangements and fight tooth and nail to keep them. From the red corner, challenges of the system not yet sure but again if the new arrangements replace old, do not fight so hard to win them. Therefore wrote an authority on change no less than Niccolo Machiavelli himself in The Prince. That book remains as cogent today as it was when it first appeared five centuries ago. Still had to sell to our heads of state as the book predicts way Omega will be. Sell it to them nonetheless, we must. We will rub Nelson Mandela in their faces. Did he not, in the interest of change, leave power after a mere five years? And now look, what? He's a legend, right? Miss Mackenzie, you're not listening to me. I am saying way Omega will put us on a new course free from the pit pitfalls that have foiled our every quest for development that have thus far. Imagine just this one scenario. Africa without... He stopped. Look who is running on now, Mrs. Mackenzie. Yet can you blame me? I begged you not to get me started, remember? Vividly, and yet... Sorry. And yet? And yet, we have four... We have your failure of states. May I be blunt here for a see? What makes you this a bit about Africa's
future now when in that book you are so fantastic about it is it the consent of way omega or the prestige of its authors he began to hit her did you say fatalistic i did but was it the word you meant see that word let me try again what makes you this a bit now mrs mackenzie i had you the first time then what well well how i had misjudged you he had seen a lamp without parents vulnerable now he's a lioness with the cubs dangerous i had taken you for a nice competent he dropped the rest of that though as ill chosen instead of measured admiration gone sour he needed something vile to project vile i should have known he said groping for a uh, vi uh, vitriolic words capable of causing third degree burns you are one of the brush reporters who confuse investigation with uh, vituperation aren't you dr afolapi you haven't answered my question what joy do you people get out of this sadistic game of yours anyway you like watching the enemy bleed is that it fine but what makes me your enemy when we have just met what did i do you're here why did you come dr aflabi i didn't i was invited do you know what that means it means presidents want my advice i repeat presidents They see merit in the book you dismiss as fatalistic and want me to assure them what way Omega resonates with it. So who cares what you think? What do you know about books? And let me add something else here. Mrs. Mackenzie. He changed his mind, a voice inside him was saying he had become much too defensive. No. On further thought, let me not because I don't think I have to apologize for my book to anyone, lest of all to uh Two bit reporter for the Zambian news. Gambian, whatever. All right, think through your book and give me an example, a specific example which way Omega resonates with. Quote Development is particularly is participatory process open to all, not an exclusive spot reserved for a few. Unquote Failure of States, chapter 3. Ninth paragraph, he had brightened up again. See? I blew that all people have a right to take part in every decision that affects their lives. And where Omega not only endorses this view, it also... Her mobile phone rang. She answered it. As she listened to the caller, she was gathering her things and, in, an, as in a side explaining why, Dr. Afolabi, I have to go. Syllabus wants me back at the office. Something has come up. Sorry. She, she hung up and put the phone away. So... In only a word now, because we have no time left, what 
is the example you are giving. Pause it there for a second and let me see if I understood you, if I understand you rather. He was bristling. A man you claim is your boss calls you to say he wants you. Therefore, I must compress my example into a word. You know, bosses, they don't like to be kept waiting. She turned over a little recorder and put it away as well. But don't worry, I'll abolish them this year. She smiled in applause of her own wit, then picked up her handbag. Listen, I really must go. She rose and started to leave, but stopped. I could come back later. Would that be okay? Absolutely not, he almost shouted. Then what do you suggest? That you go read my book, not just its blab. He stood up. Now, if you'll excuse me, I too must be off. Morning was itching towards noon. Good day. 49 foreign heads of state were in Banjul for the summit. All looked happy, and why not? Had they not escaped from troublemakers in their home countries? Bubbly and buoyant, they saw dazzling before them a trouble-free vacation in the Gambia, a country everyone kept calling the land of Kunta Kinte. All hoped to squeeze in as much rest as possible. Oh, at some point, they would each take the floor to address the summit and, as fans back home expected, actually say something. For Gambians, the presence of so many visiting dignity, dignitaries was pure hell. 49 heads of state cooled.
Give a hosting country much blows, yes, but heads of state were VIPs, very inconveniencing persons. So this favor came at a price. Nowhere was the price higher than in Africa. Here, before the VIPs arrived, bulldozers dispatched at night on missions hastily put together at slums clearance exercises, demolished roadside kiosk on which livelihoods of all families depended to enable the visitors to see the, a few streets once had sidewalks. Roads got a real um, layer of asphalt at times of maximum traffic. The better to bring a uh, motorist to a standstill when it really hurt. Checkpoints sprouted everywhere for guards to use as bastions while they exhausted bribes from passersby and created standstills of their own. When VIPs actually arrived, Water taps at which whole neighborhoods queued for hours just to get drops dried up altogether because now all water had gone to new jet fountains built to mesmerize the visitors. In the case of the Gambia, the frustration born of these impositions rose to even greater heights, stunning old Gambians into deep dazes. Yet bad as this was, there was still another type of hassle, was but less evident and therefore even was which the Gambian had to endure. Gambians called it anxiety. The visitors brought two lords of it, each burdensome to a point bordering on intended punishment. One lead was anxiety about security. The Gambian fretted to distractions about the safety of its guests while they were on its soil. Keeping assassins at bay was a tall order, even when the country had no more to protect than just its own heads of state. Now, as the world kept pointing out, 49 other heads of state had joined him to make a total of 50. So, had there been a device for measuring the risk of assassination, say in some kind of degrees, its reading would have shot up from one degree to 50 degree. degrees. If the assassinations were not coordinating plans uh, to a higher level still if they were, at this new temperature, it was possible some of the heads of state would not return to their home countries alive. Gambians worried their tops of about that prospect. Preventing it became a joint responsibility of the Ministry of Internal Security and the Ministry of Defense. This meant both the police and the army were involved. In time of state, uh, including the host, would stay in, uh, not in, in times, in time, they came up with the bizarre yet effective formula. All heads of state, including the host, would stay in one place 
the Pinnacle Hotel, located in an exclusive outskirt of Banjul. Those 50 rich tourists, tourists who had turned the Pinnacle into a home away from home now had to leave at once and seek accommodations elsewhere. Essentially, what this solution did was to reduce the 50, the 50 problems of assuring safety for 50 guests scattered in 50 different locations to a problem, one of assuring safety for a group of guests concentrated at one point. With this formula, security became no more than an elementary task of ensuring the pinnacle became and remained a fortress. What a powerful formula. It rested on two pillars, intelligence and combat. Intelligence meant secret agents melting into all nooks and crannies of Banjul and in efforts to penetrate impenetrable hideous, hideouts using every trick in the book. Their assignment was to investigate all whiffs and rumors smacking of a conspiracy to storm the pinnacle and harm its new guest. That duty went to the police. Compartment fighters would engage in battle. Any unauthorized person, male or female, adult or child, who did as much as come near the pinnacle, their mission was to kill. This call fell on the army. The army did two things. First, it ringed with a thousand soldiers the perimeter fence encircling the pinnacle. Then, it sprinkled the handled commandos on the compound inside the fence. Each of these killers, outside the fence or on the compound within, carried a functioning AK-47 with generous rounds of live ammunition. Better yet, all knew how to fire an AK-47. Better still, their order was simple. Shoot on sight. So, while the sky above may have remained open, few assassins parachute in from the sky anyway, the ground below, it was now fully covered. Alas, ground arrangements, however, meticulous, never quite eliminate all possibility of tragedy. Tragedy, rather. The ground arrangements made by the Gambian's army were no exception. So it was that one ill starred night, an expected tragedy not only threatened, it actually occurred. Soldiers shot, shot dead a man they saw scaling the pinnacle's perimeter fence. With him fell four other soldiers who, when they realized that the trespassers was a harmless drunk, tried to stop their colleagues from killing him. Murphy's law had struck. When things can go wrong, they will. No one has ever let this cut out of the bag before. And for a good reason?
the moment the cat got in, my youngest law took over. <laughs> when things go wrong, the wrongdoers hide the evidence. That is my youngest law. When things go wrong, the wrongdoers hide the evidence. Anxiety about protocol was the other lord, the visiting heads of state brought to Banjul. What did protocol mean? It meant Gambians had to refrain from off offending the visitors in any way. Not funny, African heads of state, touchy like sore thumbs, were easy to offend. The consequence of offending them, however, was grave. It could lead to war. Gambians had to forestall this possibility at all costs. That challenge was a task the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of International Cooperation gladly shared. What these ministries did was to divide it into two areas of greatness offense potential. First was food, or rather the order in which heads of state would sit at the feast. The Gambian was treating them to the day they arrived. Second was accommodation hotel accommodation. No Gambian who had played host to more guests than just himself or herself needed reminding that the seemingly simple task of sitting guests for a meal was in fact complicated business. Should this guest sit here and eat next to that one or sit there and eat next to that other, the permutations and combinations the host had to calculate and then consider quickly because incalculable, incalculable, calculate and then consider quickly became incalculable for one guest only one there were already four options from which to choose the guest could sit on the left of the host here the sole point of reference or on the right or in front or even behind for five guests there are more than 700 options by the count of 10 guests This number had jumped to over 30 million. The Gambian had 49 guests, not a pantry, a paltry 10. What happened when the guests were heads of state? The host played it safe. Eritrea and Ethiopia might recall, might, might really be one country and their citizen, uh, the same people, reasoned the host, but their presidents were not speaking to each other that week so of course they could not sit together on the other hand continued the host though kenya and tanzania once waged a heated public brawl and sealed the border between them they were pals now so their presidents could sit together and socialize in kiswahili this method precluded many options and in that way simplified choice 
worked wonders. However, if instead there were 49, it was useless because it still left open millions of options from which to choose. Then, what did the host do at state banquets? Such where, I mean, where guests were many, they followed the United Nations, like the UN, they ignored all rumors about who was not speaking to whom and simply seated everybody in an alphabetical order, come what may. Alphabetical order is unique. There is only one way of seating everybody, who no alternatives remain to what ought to be. A happier world than this does not exist. There is still a problem, though. Sitting everybody in an alphabetical order means Algeria and Angola always get the best seats, up in front, near the high table. When the lights fail or the sound system packs up, these two can still follow the proceedings. Unfortunately, alphabetical seatings also mean, means Zambia and Zimbabwe always get their seats down at the back, next to the toilets, from where they cannot even see the high table. When the lights go out or the sound system quits, big problem. Scramble the alphabet and move Zambia and Zimbabwe nearer. Algeria and Angola are further. People will not be able to find their seats because the method they used to find seats is strictly serial. Malians scan the seat of humanity before them sequentially until they spot a Malawian or a Mozambique, a Mozambique, a Mozambican and then hooray their seats must be in between now scramble this method away what happens chaos banquet hall ceases to be navig navigable well Zambia and Zimbabwe can complain all they want but their seats just have to be at the rear Algeria and Angola way to go Eritrea and Ethiopia serves you right had you stayed together as a, um, a business, you'd uh, have talked to them all. Instead, you parted and dropped that name. You only have yourselves to blame. The protocol of hotel accommodation involved two questions. First, what floor should this head of state or that take? Second, how many rooms should a delegation get? The first question was easy. Heads of state took floors up to or down in alphabetical order of their countries. Official names Algeria and Angola took top floors under A. Way to go. Botswana, Burkina Faso and Burundi followed under B. Attention. The Ivory Coast fell not under I but under C. B. Attention. The Ivory Coast fell not under I, but under C. Among the likes of Cameroon, the Comoros, and the two Congos, its official name is Republic de Côte d'Ivoire.
Djibouti and the rest came after for no known reason, unless contempt for alphabetical order was a reason. Djibouti. The Federal Republic of Nigeria crashed in under N alongside Namibia and Niger, not under F. Zambia and Zimbabwe, of course, wound up in bottom floors near the mosquitoes. The second question, how many rooms should a delegation get, was not easy, except for the United Nations General Assembly's Africa summits were the world's largest gatherings of heads of state, was African heads of state famous for their free, uh, freewheeling flamboyance came to summits in recklessly huge delegations with all manner of nephew and niece in tow. So again, how many rooms? Tricky, Gambians could be resourceful. Though they postulated that all delegations, big or small, having made it to Banjul safely, had, if only for that reason, to be equal. Clever, this enabled them to divide the number of rooms available equally by the number of delegations present. The answer was four rooms per delegation, and that was that. Case closed. End of chapter one of the Fathers of Nation, and hopefully you stay tuned for uh, chapter two of the same.